All right, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. We're about 10 minutes after the hour, and I want to make sure we have time for the, the talk and for the questions. I want to start by introducing myself. I'm Julie Allen. I'm the <clears throat> outgoing president of SAS. I have been president for two of the most exciting years in recent SAS history. Um, looking back, there were some years during World War II when we missed our conference. And, and not to say these are the same kinds of situations. They have been certainly um, as disruptive for our programming. But we're very excited to be here together virtually this year. We are sad to miss the chance to socialize and connect last year in Puerto Rico. We're very excited to have that opportunity next year instead. Um, so please do mark your calendars for Puerto Rico 2022. But this chance to have a virtual conference with uh, SAS members around the world is unprecedented in SAS history and um, very exciting, though also um, very uh, nerve-wracking, I think, for uh, particularly Kimberly, who is in charge of the um, <laughs> the technical side of it. So I hope everyone will be patient. We've all spent a year learning, honing our patient skills um, and our humility with regard to technical um, innovation. So I will go ahead and um, welcome you to the conference and introduce Andy Nestingen, the incoming president of SAS and the organizer um, of this first-time virtual conference. Andy. Thank you, Julie. Uh, well, I can say it's a beautiful morning in Seattle. It's you know sunny, and, and I wish you could all be here, but uh, that's not that wasn't wasn't fated to be. So here we are, virtually, um, as Julie mentioned, a uh, a mode of meeting to which we've become accustomed. Accustomed. Um, so I just want to first say a huge, huge thank you to uh, Kimberly LaPalm, the executive director of, of SAS, as well as, Mia Filar as well as Mia Filardi, a UW uh, undergraduate student who's been an intern with the conference, who've really done a heavy, heavy lifting to make sure this all happens. And um, I think everything is going to be really, really nice on the CVent platform, even if there are, the, of course, a few technical difficulties. So I just want to um, uh, Kimberly will be uh, will be leading us in the uh, Q&A section of the um, meeting here or the keynote meeting this morning. And so before I um, um, introduce our, our keynote speaker, I just wanted to invite Kimberly to take the floor and say a few words just about for technical instructions about how to ask questions when that part of the uh, uh, keynote occurs after the after uh, Professor Hawkinson completes his uh, remarks. Kimberly, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. And I want to welcome everyone again. And I want to echo Julie's sentiment about um, we appreciate your patience <laughs> as we navigate some of the technical issues here. Um, and we're going to ask that for this Q&A um, and actually for, for Q&As throughout the conference, you use the chat feature in Zoom uh, to submit your questions. So that's at the bottom of your screen, uh, somewhere near the middle. middle. Uh, and if you submit a typed question, then that allows the moderator, which for this session is myself, um, to call on people individually or to ask questions individually, which will prevent some of that talking over each other that, that we've seen happen in Zoom. Um, if you have any other technical questions, you can send a direct message in the chat to myself or to Mia, uh, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. So it's a really great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the 2021 SAS uh, annual conference um, under a little bit different circumstances than we had first imagined. Uh, when the organizing committee decided on ecologies and economies as a theme for SAS 2021, we thought of Seattle's location on the Salish Sea, ancestral home of the Salish peoples. The sea links south to, Californ to the California coast and north to Alaska, as well as to East Asia and Russia. Who could speak to this ecological and economic nexus and connect it to Scandinavia as well? We soon reached a consensus about a brilliant UW colleague, University of Washington colleague, Professor Sven D. Hawkinson. Sven grew up in the Sukpiat community in southern, in a Sukpiat community in southern Alaska, which, uh, which also had connections to Norwegian and Danish people, as Sven's name suggests. Alaska's history also connects to Russia and many Finnish settler colonialists who came to Alaska during the Russian period. As an undergraduate, Professor Håkansson attended an Inuit studies conference in Copenhagen, which sparked his interest in documenting, preserving, and revitalizing indigenous culture. 
Later, he lived and worked with a Nenet community of reindeer herders in Siberia. Professor Holkan said sees, the, sees connections of the entire circumpolar region with its communities and their interconnections. And through, he does so through a distinct lens. In recent years, working with the collections of the new Burke Museum at the University of Washington, Professor Holkanson has become a leader in advancing a decolonizing role for museums in the preservation of indigenous culture. Professor Holkanson engages with indigenous communities who bring their knowledge and cultural heritage to rethink the museum as an institution. Uh, Sven Hawkinson is curator of Native American anthropology at the University of Washington's Burke Museum, as well as associate professor of anthropology at the, UW, at the UW. He's won many awards and honors for his work, including a MacArthur Fellowship in 2007, a Museums Alaska Award for Excellence in 2008, the ATALM Guardians of Culture and Lifeways Leadership Award in 2012. In 2012. Um, his work on the Ankiak, a Sukpiak type of kayak led it to be inducted to the Alaska Innovators Hall of Fame in 2020. Join me in welcoming Professor Sven Holkinson. Koyan uh, Andy for uh, first inviting me to participate and to um, be able to share uh, my work and research and my um, the work I do with my community with all of you. Um, I just want to start with acknowledging we are on, I am on the lands of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, and this is important to, to recognize um, where we are, um, especially in, in North America and on whose lands we are originally, um, whose lands these are originally were. Um, on that note, I'm going to start my presentation, but um, I just want to say, um, it was attending the Six Inuit Studies Conference that changed my life. Uh, and that was in Copenhagen, Denmark, and it was the first country I'd ever went to outside of, of um, Alaska. Um, so uh, thank you for reminding me about that, Andy. I uh, hadn't realized that um, way back then that um, my whole life had changed by going to going home, going to where my grandfather was from. Um, I am Hui Ikasuk. E Sven Hawkinson me e Kichtachemut. Um my name is Sven Hawkinson. Um everybody at home knows me as Fish. I'm from the island of Kodiak, and I'm gonna share my work with you here. And start that. And I and I start my presentations talking about the, the local and global. Um and I want you guys to think about, okay, how do, we, how do we do this individually, but then how do we do that at a larger scale? And as scholars, your work is global because it's written. And written, the written word actually goes a lot further than just us speaking. Um, I want to then ask you another question. How do we see each other? What is history if nothing but the past living in the present as lessons for our future? And how have we used history um, to control the ongoing narrative of who, what, where, and how we live? What happens when we ask a question that makes us uncomfortable and challenges our knowledge, our presence, our ways of being and understanding who we are? And this is in reference to not only Black Lives Matter, but the awareness of acknowledging um, whose lands we are on. But what do we do with this knowledge when we learn and now know about it? And here's where um, I feel it's very important to think about our history, our past, our present, our responsibility and our future. And in this essence, um, I've taken that philosophy and started to think about how do I reverse these studies um, and honor the knowledge of our ancestors by using what was collected by outsiders. In, in my life experience, I've had the privilege to work with Nanette reindeer herders in the Yamal Peninsula, Russia, in this part of um, Russia and Siberia, um, working with them where I saw and learned about them from their way of life. They spoke their language, they practiced their traditional ways, um, and they'd have had contact with Europeans for over 500 years. Yet they still live in their traditional way. Um, 
traveling across the Amal, practicing their language and their religion and their worldviews. And it's like, I'm sitting here as I'm working with them going, how is this possible um, when we have had our cultures nearly erased? Theirs is a living culture. Traditional ways of living, language, beliefs, and heritage are all passed on in a living context. This sparked something in me that I realized when I have, um, when I finished my um, doctorate, um, what I could do at home. And so I started thinking about how can we repatriate the knowledge back to our communities so they own it. This is the village I grew up in, called Old Harbor on Kodiak Island, which is right here. Um, and this really changed how I started looking at what I was doing. It made me question the history. It made me want to learn more. It made me want to explore and try to understand um, where we are now, but how we can move forward in the future. How do we use this knowledge um, and what happened to us? Um, you have Refuge Rock, which is an important thing for Alaska. This is where the Russians took over, conquered the Lutik people, but claimed Alaska in 17, August 13th of 1784. Um, so the Russians controlled Alaska from 1784 to 1867. Um, the American period is 1867 to now. And this is the village I grew up in, um, up until I was 16 years old. But the historical accounts, the earliest written documentation of our communities um, started with Captain Cook. There was some Russian stuff, but the, the earliest written English stuff is with Captain Cook in 1778 when they came into the Prince William Sound um, and sailed through here looking for the Northwest Passage and then went by. And what's interesting, and I didn't know this until about 10 years ago, um, Captain Cook and his crew, they named a couple of places outside of where I grew up, um, Cape Barnabas um, and Two-Headed Island. And so that was interesting to find out. But one of the things I started doing um, is looking into these historical accounts and looking at the drawings and the, like the drawings here by Weber. Um, and you see this open boat here, Anyak, which I'm gonna come back to. Um, these are little um, clues of, hey, what's there? What can we learn? But as I'm reading these historical accounts, and, and I'm gonna read this, um, through which we descended down a ladder made of a thick piece of wood with steps cut in, in it, into a dark and dirty cave seemingly underground where our noses were instantly saluted with the potent stink of putrid fish, which was scattered about the house. We were welcomed into these murky caves by the master of the house and his wife and other females sitting together in one part of the hut Having been used to many strange scenes since we left England, we spent no time in staring about us with vacant astonishment, but immediately made love to the handsomest woman in company who in order to make us welcome, refused us no favor she could grant, though her husband or father stood by. Having thus paid proper attention to the women, we had time to look about us with um, us and admire the structure and furniture of one of these strange habitations. Uh, the, I, when I read um, immediately made love to the handsomest woman in company. Um, I've gone back and forth with a couple of folks on this, but to me, I read that as they raped them. They raped the women because they had no choice or no say so. In fact, the reason I say that is when Captain Cook's crew came back several months later, passed through again, they had a huge outbreak of gonorrhea in those communities. And so that in itself um, was really hard to understand, not only because in this drawing, I used to look at this and go, wow, look at all the cues and clues of clothing and tools and bay, um, bent with bowls and mats. I used to look at these drawings, which are stunning. But Weber drew these after that happened. So even in that instance, um, this has become a revisionist part of their history, uh, the, our history. And, and as I start to really think more deeply about this um, and try to understand how do we change this, but how do we move forward from it? Because we're still living with this. It's a snapshot of our past. 
and we have to rebuild our knowledge that, um, that is discussed in these scattered historical accounts and collections outside of our communities. They give a snapshot of what happened and show us what we're still dealing with in our communities. Moving forward from Captain Cook to the Russian period to the American period, how we were treated and viewed. Wearing our skin clothing, we were considered uncivilized. And what was to be done with us? Well, let's change your clothing. Oh, look, it even says civilized there. We're civilized now, now that we've changed our clothing. Um, after living in Siberia and wearing all the fancy clothing and gear, um, when I donned and when I put on the reindeer skin clothing, I was not cold at 50 below. So I, I look at the, the, the community here who, are put these, who put these clothing on. I bet they were cold that winter. But our life today on Kodiak, my Uncle Carl, my Uncle Harold, um, you know, they're all running multi-million dollar boats. We're celebrating Christianity. We're celebrating the 4th of July. We have our own museums now. Um, and we're starting to learn more about who our ancestors were through our historical accounts. And in 1991, well, in 1991, in 2000, in 1999, I wrote a grant before I went back to run the Aleutic Museum. And I wanted to even then reverse the way we did things through our institution. Instead of keeping things and hoarding things into our institution, how do we get the information back to the communities from where it came? And that meant designing a traveling exhibit, traveling traditions, um, to fly out by these small single engine airplanes. And this one is a double engine to these rural communities on, across Kodiak Island. So for 13 years, every one week a year, I'll go to each of the villages to share what I had learned and what we were learning um, from these collections, bringing knowledge back that had been stripped and erased from who we were. We did mass carving, games, fish skin sewing, basket weaving, bentwood bowls. And every year we bring something new to the community um, and collaborate with each community and what they wanted. Um, so building on that knowledge over years. And so you have that knowledge in knowing and living. And then not only using museum collections, working with local knowledge. The village of Akiak, they are um, situated next to one of the largest petroglyph sites in Alaska, and that's at Cape Alatak. And when we started doing this, when I started doing this project, we thought there were about three, maybe 400. Over the last now 20 years, we found over 1,369. Um, so it's been an amazing experience to be able to bring that knowledge, but gather that knowledge ourselves and have the local community own that knowledge as we are moving forward. But what else is out there? In um, 2000s, I went to the MAE, Museum of Anthropology and Ethnography in St. Petersburg, and photographing their collections. They have the largest collection of Sukhbiet, Unangan, and Shinket material in the world, and pieces that were actually used in context. Um, so when I was looking at the kayaks, I sketched this kayak out with the idea of creating a project for our Lutik Weeks and working with Alfred Nomov here, who, when he was 17, was learning from the elders about kayak making when no one else was listening. So working with him, we went out to the villages and we made over 28 model kayaks, no glue, no nails, following traditional practices. And I felt very lucky to be able to collaborate with Alfred here um, during these weeks because it, it really taught me a lot um, but it also showed me how important it is to be able to listen to the communities to know who the culture bearers are. The people that have that living knowledge that are still sharing it and passing it on. Well, as I mentioned earlier in the, um, the start of my talk where I was talking about um, Weber and his drawings. In Weber, there was another vessel that we didn't know existed on Kodiak until the 2000s. 
and it's called, called an anyak. Everything, all the time, these boats are usually called umiaks, but they're not. Uh, from south of Nome, they should be called anyaks, and north of Nome, they should be called umiaks. Um, and those are cultural um, designated things between the Yupik and Sukhpiat um, and the Inupiat. Um, but these boats disappeared from use on Kodiak by the 1860s. And what really fascinated me with is this cultural thing, uh, this bulbous bow. What is that? Well, these Anyaks are rare. I've only found 15 of them so far across the world in different museums. The largest collection is at the MAE and they have five of them um, collected before, um, I think it's 1841. In 2018, I found another one. Um, and in fact, this one here has everything set backwards. So um, the bow is actually here, not, not there. But again, as I go to different museums, I've found things, I, I looked through historical accounts, I found things. Well, in 2013, when I changed positions and became a curator at the Burke Museum, the Burke Museum, I'd found one in their collection in 2007. And so was, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to study this um, Anyak, sketch it out, um, do 3D rendering. But more importantly, um, I spoke with Mitch Simeonov and um, uh, the Spiridon family, um, the Simeonov family, uh, about doing a project with them during the Akyak Culture Weeks. And so I spent the winter of 2014 making kits cutting out kits and taking that knowledge and trying to figure out, okay, how can I do this within a week with students? Um, and then on my way back to Kodiak, I stopped off at the Aleutic Museum to look at the archeological pieces to see what they have. Went out to Akiak, which is a camp I've been going out to since 2000 and I continue to go out there. I'll go out there again this year. Um, um, but working with the Simiana family and working with students, we were able to, in that week, make 13 model Anyaks in that time period and bringing that knowledge back for the first time in over 150 years, making it with no glue, no nails, and sharing that knowledge from a collection, from collections back to the community from where they belong. What was also interesting is when I was sharing that project with a friend, he's like, oh yeah, I've just added this bulbous bow to my boat. And I was like, well, yeah, but if, if the documents are right, these boats, these bulb, this bulbous bow and these vessels have been with us for well over a thousand years. And I asked him, so what does it do? And he's like, well, it increases the speed and decreases the energy consumption into moving it. And I was like, wow. And he's like, yeah, well, that's um. And then I was talking with an officer from the U.S. Navy. And he's like, oh yeah, we we use the nose of a dolphin, and supercomputers to design that, so that our boats are more efficient and faster. And that really made me step back to question this thing I grew up with being. I was told that we are dumb natives, we knew nothing. This cultural knowledge this ecological knowledge of understanding um, how to create a vessel that was more efficient, energy efficient, and, and goes faster. Um, it, it's pretty amazing when you, when you think about that and think about that, um, I wanna say genius, that preceded our now new, new um, our need of supercomputers to, to comprehend these things. How can we take this to the next level? Can we construct a full-size Anyak so it's relevant to our communities? And how do we put this knowledge back into a living context so it is owned by the communities and not forgotten? So after 2014, Mitch Simeonov said, let's make a big one. And I was like, okay, I, let me figure it out. So again, I spent 2014 to 2015 that year um, at the Burke Museum um, over the year, I would over that year, I would collect wood. I got wood from Jensen's Motorboat Company, the Sea Alaska Corporation Community Development Program, and 
also biking in and I actually broke my bike frame uh, carrying too much wood at one time. And the summer of spring of 2015 in the back of the Burke, the old Burke, I constructed, um, we constructed, I say we, because anybody who was working at the Burke, I was like, here's a saw, here's sandpaper, um, here's the planer, help please. And everybody took 10 minutes to an hour of their time um, helping make this uh, vision come true. And so in the spring, we created the frame. I was working with Dr. Peter Lape um, and our community to create this frame. We disassembled that in that summer, 2015, I went back out to the Akiak community um, to work with the Simiana family and everybody else who participated. Here you've got Mitch, um, you've got Spiridon and Spiridon Jr. You've got three generations right there all working on this Anyak. And the first time this boat was built in over 150 years on Kodiak Island. So that summer, that week, we went from collecting the wood off the beach to creating a frame of an Anyak. That winter, coming back in 2015, the Burke Museum gave me um, gallery space and I used that time to finish the frame. Um, and I invited anybody and everybody who was coming by. I had deans and professors and students and visitors, um, even people came down from Alaska to help, to help us finish this frame and tie it together uh, and sew the skin on it. We used a fabric that was donated by George Dyson to cover it, cover the Anyak, and we tested it out in the spring of 2016. Um, luckily, we put enough people in here so that it didn't roll for the first time. And the other fun thing too is um, in a model from Germany, um, they had a steering paddle, which was very different from our regular paddles. So that was fun to piece that together. And I found that, I remembered the photograph, I printed it out by that night, I had a full size paddle made. Well, I went back to Akiak in 2016 and we completed the tying, working with the Akiak Kids Camp. And in that time period, um, working with everybody, we had to make um, all the paddles, everything. And it took us 10 hours of sewing um, to get this one right. And, and again, every time we learn, every time we made one, um, I've learned something new about it. Well, what was beautiful about this whole experience was Mitch wanted to, we made the paddle, um, but he wanted to show that every kid, every youth that was involved would have a hand in that. And they did participate. And so he put their handprints on the steering paddle for this. And we were able to complete it. Um, so it was a pretty big event for, for us to bring that lived knowledge into a place where we were doing it ourselves and we were celebrating it. And so when we tested it out, one of the things that um, we didn't know at that time uh, is you need to add ballast. But it was exciting to have this vessel done um, in by 2016. But I say we need to have the ballast because as we learn, we learn from our mistakes. Um, when we all got in, into it within the first minute, um, if one person moves the wrong way, this is what happens. <laughs> you roll. We had to put in 300 pounds of ballast into this vessel because it was so light in order to make it more stable. And that was a lesson that we learned, but now we know um, and the next generation knows what um, they can do and, and how they can actually engage with um, this vessel again. And that intergenerational learning has really, um, is really part of what uh, I feel is important for us to be doing as scholars. How do we get that knowledge to them? So they understand it, they live with it, they understand how to use it, but then it also changes what they do. And I'm gonna share a video here, and I want you to listen to the words 
um, and I'll reflect on that after. Votes are all important. That's how we feed our families. Well, the Anyak has been a dream of ours for a long time. The Anyak is, is a, a dream that my father had. This is something that he's always wanted to build. My role in building the Anyak is helping my father realize his dream. The camp started when my husband and I first sobered up. My parents, when they quit drinking, it's like their eyes got open to the, to the village. This is a culture camp. They're learning their culture while they're here. They're learning how to hunt. How to process food. How to cook it, how to store it. Showing the kids how to share cultural artwork. And so it's the culture here of learning. This is what I see. I see a community that's healing. I want to um, reflect on how Mitch and Judy were talking. Um, they own this knowledge now. The community owns this knowledge, not the Burke Museum, not Sven Hawkinson, not some other institution. The community owns this knowledge. And I think as scholars, that for me is, this, uh, for, as a scholar, that is successful because we've been able to, I've been able to be part of a process that's bigger than all the things we do and write about, but also changing the lives and the history of the community forever through what we share in a healthy and productive way. And I look at that as the repatriation of knowledge through cultural pieces. Collections are not stagnant. They're living with the knowledge that is embodied within them. Collections are important to our communities, not only in how we learn about them, but how we share them with each other. And I mean collections, i.e. libraries, historical accounts, ethnographic collections, our own personal collections. Um, this is one of a multi to multiple examples. This is one of multiple examples that shows how valuable our histories are in the present and how we can bring cultural pieces into a living context. And I want to end with um, as I was, I was going through um, your conference and your conference themes, uh, and I, I made some notes to myself. Innovative, past and present, Interde interdependency of collectivism, living landscapes through our lived knowledges, knowing our past, caring for our future, changing with the knowledge we know now, moving into our futures, embracing cultural diversity and celebrating each other, for me, this is what it means to be Scandinavian and native as one. Thank you for uh, your time and your, uh, thank you for allowing me to share this with you. And thank you, Dr. Hogansson, so much for joining us and, and for sharing your thoughts and your experience with us. Um, I wanna open it up now to the audience, um, if anyone has any questions um, for our keynote speaker, if you could type your question in the chat. Uh, they're always very quiet at the beginning. 
<laughs> uh, let's see, we have one here from, from Tim Frandy. Um, Tim says, thank you for sharing a bit of the very important work you're doing. I'd like to ask more about watercraft in general and the central role they serve in decolonization projects across cultures. Why do you think that canoes and other watercraft are at the forefront of so much decolonization work? What other forms of cultural expression are in need of revitalization in the communities you work in to serve these kinds of decolonizing agendas? That's a really good question in terms of why, is, why are these vessels so important? Because they symbolize um, something that is tangible um, to us as a community that brings us together. Um, canoe journeys here in um, Washington um, that has brought the Coast Salish communities together in a way that helps them and well, doesn't help them, allows them to celebrate who they are um, on their terms and in their way it is one way that um, allows the communities to um, decolonize or take back what was taken from them but also to celebrate it. And to me, that brings in that diversity of who we are as people. So that, that's one example of, of multiple uh, piece of uh, collections, I guess. We can look at the clothing design. We can look at, um, like in my region, we, a project I worked on for a decade was uh, masks, um, taking um, the knowledge of masks that were taken out and putting it back into a living context. So we're now using those as ways to celebrate our history and understand our um, knowledge. Uh, the mask making that was, um, that disappeared from our region, that's a, that's a whole nother project I didn't even touch on. Thank you. And um, it looks like we also have a question from Scott Miller. Scott, if you wanna turn on your microphone and, and ask your question, um, you can do that. Yeah, sure. Um, I was just curious, I suppose I could turn my camera on too so you can see me. Um, I was just curious what kind what kinds of challenges you had using um, modern materials. It looked like you were using uh, you didn't use skins when you were making, but you were using some other materials. Were there things that you learned and um, challenges that you had using those modern materials? Um, well, for, first, it's it's a lot easier using um, modern materials while well, using plastics because they last longer than skins, um, and it would take us about two years to get enough skins to cover the onyak, which is nine sea lines. Um, and to process those is, is a lot of work. Um, but also, um, so what we did is we adapted to more modern materials so we can actually um, not only complete it, but we still were able to follow the waterproof stitch um, in that process with that materials. Um, so those, 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 that knowledge was not lost. Um, some of the other things that we will be doing over the next few years is um, teaching the students how to, teaching our youth how to process the skins, especially if they're still harvesting those animals so that they're not wasted anymore. So those, those are ongoing projects. Um, yeah, that, that's where we're at right now. Um, but the other thing too, I like your question about modern materials is we did purchase um, like for the Akiak, the reason the Anyak was only 16 feet long is because I could only fit uh, 13 foot beams on a plane to fly it down. Right, um, right. But now what we've been doing is gathering the wood off the beach um, so that we can make them traditionally. Um, and in that, we're teaching the students about the ecology of our region of driftwood, um, how to gather the wood, how to process it, how to cure it, um, and then how to make sure that when you make the kayak, it, it um, is made in the right way. And that's thanks to Alfred Nomo. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And it looks like we have another question here from Ann Heath, Ann. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll start my video. <laughs> Is. So uh, this is actually a rather complex question, but it is about all these objects in museums worldwide. It's the same situation with the uh, uh, Sami artifacts uh, and objects that have sort of been displayed and disseminated. Uh, and of course, many of these objects, um, it could be argued that they were 
stolen or that uh, they came to the <laughs> museums in uh, rather sort of obscure ways. Uh, for example, there are uh, sacred objects that uh, are sort of uh, displayed in a profane uh, context and things like that. Uh, have you sort of any I, thoughts about um, the possibility of retrieving some of these objects? Because I imagine that uh, they would sort of uh, possibly play an extremely important role at local museums in Alaska. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, your your question is very complex in terms of how do we negotiate yeah. not only the, the current laws um, and past actions, and how do we negotiate those, those issues, especially um, when you're dealing with or addressing like for example the materials i work with are not they don't fall under nagra the native american grazing repatriation act of 1990 uh, for the united states um, so in europe they don't have those laws yet um, that 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 um, i want to say that awareness um, of what these cultural pieces really mean to the communities has not um, struck home yet and, and I think as Europeans become more aware of not only their role in the, the world, but the impacts they've had, some of those pieces might go home. But for me, um, starting in 2000, I realized that uh, European laws are not going to be moving that fast. So I got a grant in 2006 and I took artisans to France to learn from the collections and take the knowledge back in that way and build a relationship with that institution, with the Chateau Musée in boulogne sur mer um, build a relationship with them so that they understand that we want to work with them. We're not trying to tear them down or you know take things back. How do we build a relationship that's built on mutual trust? And how do we move forward from there? Because eventually I think, um, what will happen with a lot of institutions there, I hope they develop um, exchanges. And that's what we did with the museum um, um, in Boulogne-sur-Mer, the Chateau Musée. Um, the Aleutic Museum now has rotating um, pieces coming from there for every two years to Kodiak to share, and then they change them out. Um, so, you know, they have that ongoing relationship where there is um, sharing, they're sharing that knowledge. I mean, while it'd be nice to have the pieces back, uh, this is what works right now. But um, how do we start that process? And that is just doing it. Rolling your sleeves, I'm saying, okay, how can we do this right? Because we know what's right. Um, how do we make and act on that? And as scholars, we have an, an important responsibility for helping communities do this. It, it, it takes a lot to step back and say, all right, that's, um, it's important for the community, not important for me as a scholar. Thank you. Thank you for that. And it looks like Andy has a question. Uh, yeah, um, thank you, Sven, for the talk. I really, really enjoyed, enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to ask you how your work with your community um, and your, your, your thinking about live knowledge uh, intersects with your thinking about your curatorial practice. You're, of course, a curator at the Burke as well. And I know that there, for those who don't know, a really huge uh, new museum has been opened um, in which you played a key role. And I would just wonder if you could remark a little bit about um, the relationship between that living knowledge of your community and um, your curatorial practice. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, well, my community has influenced uh, how I actually go about doing my curator curatorial work at the Burke. Um, for example, when you come into um, the new gallery, Culture is Living, we designed it to uh, follow and respect traditional um, our traditional cultural ways. Uh, for example, when you walk in, you're greeted by the peoples of Washington first. 
they're the ones welcoming you into the space and they should be the ones welcoming you into the space because we're on their land. But as you go throughout the exhibit, it's designed so that um, in, in our community, our children are at the core uh, of our lives. Um, and so you'll go in and right at the core is the children's gallery, children's space. So the kids can go there, but then you go around through cultures and earth, air, water. Um, so it's all tied together to show that inner connection that we have to not only each other, but to our planet, to our one planet. Um, and bringing in those, um, that lived um, worldview. So that's really influenced in terms of how I do my, um, how we've done that exhibit. But in terms of my curatorial practices, one of the things that we do follow is um, we try to make sure that we learn about the culture protocols for all the cultural pieces we have. And that's a lot of work. And I start with, we don't know, but if communities are willing to share with us um, the importance of how we treat and care for these pieces, their histories, um, their cultural ancestors, um, how do we move forward in a respectful way? Thank you. And, and Julie, did you have a follow up question? Well, I don't have the follow up question. It's actually kind of an awkward question, but I was just struck in your um, description of the Captain Cook encounter. I'm working on some Captain Cook things for in a different context. And um, I was struck by you. You mentioned how you've had conversations with people about what this passage means, and you've opted in favor of reading it as a literal account of, of sexual assault. And and doesn't the, the I don't, as I said, in my question, I don't feel like that. I have no doubt that sexual assault was part of that encounter. Um, I just was a little confused by that particular passage being read that way. And I wonder if you could talk more about those conversations. Um, it, they, it was brought up to me is that while they were flirting, they were flirting with the women. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see that, um, you know, and especially when you read the accounts of what they did elsewhere and then their own practice. And people don't, I, know that I don't think that person understood that by that time, the Russians had taken all the weapons for the men to defend themselves. They taken all their large open boats so they couldn't escape. Um, and if they did anything wrong, they would kill that person and their family. So they were silenced on all those levels. So for somebody to come in who had cannons, who had muskets, who had superior weapons, you had no ability to speak up. I mean, I, I think about that and it's like, as you know, think, I think about, wow, what would I have done or what could I have done myself? But then, you know, six years later, same thing happened in Kodiak. Um, and we haven't addressed the fact that um, not only were the women um, brutalized in this, but think about what happened to the men when you have no ability to protect the one thing that is important to you, your family. Everything else doesn't matter and you can't even protect them without them and you being killed for trying to protect them. Okay, but I mean, so that, that phrasing of making love isn't used in a sexual sense until the 1920s. Um, you, I'm just trying to figure it, so you, you really, Feel like they came into this hut and immediately ravaged the women as a sort of an opening of negotiations no they didn't they didn't have to um they they could do whatever they wanted well, I mean, as with establishing dominance that was so yeah that's appalling thanks i mean it's it, i just I, I look and read that and i'm i'm sitting there i mean it took me a while to um really come to a better understanding of it because when you gloss over it, oh, made love, it's no big deal. Well, wait a minute, what? How, how was that possible? And, and you think about um, the words they were using. The, even this is, that was written by one of his officers. That wasn't written by Captain Cook. Because Captain Cook never even talks about any of that. Um, and so, um, you know, it's like they were writing what they saw and what they experienced. They weren't really hiding the truth. Fair enough. Thanks. And actually, I have a, 
a follow-up question from Tim Franny in the chat, um, and he's asked me to read it because he's having some mic issues, um, but it, it actually may be a, a good transition from this last question. Um, he asked, can you talk a bit about the possible tensions of doing decolonizing work within historically colonial institutions like universities and museums, uh, and what do universities and museums need to do to decolonize their institutions? Well, there's, I mean, all right, so we've been studying this stuff for our whole lives, but when somebody comes and says, hey, you're wrong, what happens? You get defensive. You're like, wait a minute, how can I be wrong? How can I be wrong this whole time? Instead, I would say, well, we need to start thinking about how this was written. And I had this discussion um, with some colleagues um, on Monday uh, talking about how do we interpret um, historical accounts, but then how do we write about them today? Because they were written from a very colonial perspective um, as they were written down. Um, and I'll use one example that I have just right here in front of me was, um, I was translating some Russian texts. And in there, they're talking about our, our religion and our beliefs. Um, they're talking about a shaman who um, was uh, shamanizing. And when he was asked, how he got his predictions, he, when he, um, when asked who tells him the future, he responded in the Russian text, they wrote devil, who serves me or several devils. And so if I wrote it that way, that makes those traditional religious practices seem very, very bad, evil. But thinking about it from the perspective of a um, trying to understand, wait a minute, why would one want to get the help of a devil unless you're going to do bad all the time when they're trying to do good for the community? So to me, I read that as um, when asked who tells him, uh, who tells the future to him, he responded, spirits who serve me or several spirits. Even that one word changes how we see what people were doing in the past. Um, so those are things that I think we should be looking at how our histories have been interpreted uh, from that perspective and go back and reflect on that so that we can think about, okay, what were they thinking then? Who was saying it? How was it being said? And was it meant to demean them and erase that knowledge? Because you have somebody who's writing this who wants to suppress or erase any traditional religion, traditional beliefs, and replace it with an organized belief. I mean, I, I worked with elders on translating Canard's texts and songs from my tribe. I had one elder who's very staunch Christian, and it didn't change her beliefs, but she's like, oh, that's all satanic stuff. And I'm like, well, you're one of the few, few fluent speakers. I need your help. So she helped me. And by the end of that process, after two years, she looked at me and said, wow, these aren't about satanic worship. They're not about devil. They're about taking care of each other. They're about our history. They're about how do we make sure we sustain ourselves into the future. And those are the songs that were sung, but we were told that they were all about you know, going around in devil worship, which they had nothing to do with that. And this is coming from an elder who was helping me reinterpret a Lutic text that were written in 1872. I think we have a, a follow-up from Jason. Um, hi, good, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for your, uh, very, very interesting talk. Um, I think you partially answered my question, though, with your last comment. Um, so I'll give you an opportunity maybe to expand on it. And I had some, um, your your talk cut out for a moment. So if I'm asking something that you you discussed, uh, 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 please please forgive me. Um, the um, What you just talked about in terms of dealing with this devout Christian, um, 
raised a question with me in that you, you're repatriating information and knowledge to the community. Um, do you have any other um, difficult, have you had any other difficult experiences in, in bringing that information back uh, to, to people? It, you know, you can bring information to people, but it's not, or knowledge, but it's not always comfortable, I would, I would suspect, well, I've been taught about that knowledge. Jason, you asked a very... Um, so you, you already answered that in your, your last question uh, or a little bit, but if you want to expand more on that question of, you know, um, uncomfortable discussions. Um, yeah, I mean, your, your question is spot on because that's another challenge that we have as scholars bringing back that knowledge, but how do we bring it back so that the communities can engage with it from a healthy perspective instead of getting angry, instead of um, having it rip them apart. When I wanted to bring this information up 20 years ago, um, one of the elders said I couldn't. Um, they asked that I change how I shared that. I didn't understand what they were asking, but he says, we're not ready for it. My question then is, if we're not ready for it, when are we going to be ready for it? And I think now is the time. Now is the time to have these difficult discussions, to be open and honest about it and, and find ways to say, look, we can't change the past, but we can change the future when we, as we're moving forward in, in a way that allows us to um, be healthier to each other. And that's a lot of work um, because there's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain that people um, continue to carry forward and that we continue to do it to each other. Uh, and I've, I've started to come up with the mantra that you can't fight racism with racism. It doesn't work. It only backfires. Um, how do we not only fight that, but how do we change how we move forward in a way that um, can allow the communities to grow and heal from that past, but to be able to grow and heal and thrive moving forward. And this is where what we do matters. What we write about matters. We might not think, you know, oh, you know, I'm just doing this. There, there are implications to what we do and what we write. Thank you. Jay, would you like to, to ask your question? Um, sure. Uh, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, I'll, I'll connect you. Hang on just a moment. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Then I have to do that. Oh, here I am. Um, no, I, I was fascinated by your experience in Siberia. I wondered how that came about. Uh, um, my work in Siberia actually was, uh, I originally wanted to do ethnoarchaeology in uh, the Sakha Yakutsk Republic, but there was some challenges between the, um, some professors between UAF and Hokkaido. And, and so I had gotten money to go in 94 that fell through, but then I had heard about um, uh, this guy named Bill Fitzhugh doing work up in um, the Amal, and I had just helped his son Ben Fitzhugh um, two years prior to get a project to work in my village um, to do some survey work. And so I called Ben up and said, hey, Ben, um, I speak Russian. Do you think your dad would be interested in having me tag along with him on his survey work into the Amal? And he's like, I don't know, go ahead and give him a call. Here's his number. So I called him up and he, Bill Fitzhugh was really open. He's like, well, meet me in Moscow on July 4th um, at this time and we'll go from there. Uh, so I flew across Siberia from Alaska, met him on July 4th and um, started building relationships with him and Andrei Golovnyov, um, who's now the director of the MAE. Um, and uh, um, ended up being able to build relationships locally with the collective, um, the president of the, of the Kolkhoz. Uh, from there, he was able to set me up with a brigade 
um, who I then went and lived and worked with for um, half a year in 96 and seven months in 97. Oh, thank you. And it looks like uh, Edith, if you'd like to uh, to turn on your your mic and ask your question. Oh, sorry, I didn't actually have a question, but um, I just remembered reading a book about a Danish explorer in Greenland who had a similar description of being allowed to have sex with native women. And I don't know the title and I don't know, I can't remember, it's been several years since I read it, but I'm hoping that somebody else might be able to pitch in. It, it sounds like nobody else is familiar, Edith, but we have two weeks of, uh, of conversation and things coming up. So maybe we can um, we can find someone in another session who's who's familiar with that, who can uh, share that title with you. Oh, nope, Marianne seems to have an answer for you in the chat. <laughs> um, and with that, actually, I'm gonna pass it back to Andy. Hey, well, I just wanna say a huge thank you to Sven for a very, uh, thought-provoking talk about the status of knowledge in its different contexts, its life over centuries as knowledge changes, as it changes and is produced and reproduced and, and moves. Um, it really uh, sets a great uh, beacon for us as we ask questions about knowledge. It's both its history and um, the way in which we we take it up as scholars to think about it and and produce try to produce new knowledge that that uh, interacts with other kinds of living knowledge. So thank you, Sven, for a very very stimulating talk. Um, and then thank you as well to the audience, both um, in scattered across the, the world as it is. Um, we're able to join from the West Coast on, uh, of, of the United States uh, in the morning and of course in the evening in, in, in Europe. So thank you so much to everyone for joining for this keynote talk. The uh, conference proper starts tomorrow morning and uh, we look forward to the papers and, and all the interactions and hope, hope that you will um, enjoy it very much even in this virtual context and, uh, and uh, look forward to the, to, to the coming conversations to come. So thanks for joining this morning and we will see you tomorrow when the official conference begins. And thanks again, uh, Professor Holkansson for a great talk to get us started. So long. <laughs>